For so long I carried the weight of my past Crippled by burdens like stones on my back I thought I had fallen too far from your grace But you came and showed me the way When I was a lost soul searching You were the ground beneath my feet When I was a blind man begging You were the eyes so I could see When the smoke was rising up You were the air that I could breathe You gave me hope You gave me something to believe Now I'm alive and born again Rescued from the grip of sin God, your love came crashing in And pulled me out of the fire I'm a survivor Now all I can see are the fields of your grace Wherever I run, you're leading the way You shook the shackles off my feet I found redemption on my knees You gave me hope, you gave me something to believe Now I'm alive and born again Rescued from the grip of sin God, your love came crashing in And pulled me out of the fire Aren't we all survivors? We're survivors because God is out there and has given us that lifeline of salvation. Amen. Is that why we're here to worship him this morning? Come on. Is that why we're here to worship him this morning? Amen. That's right. God is good and all the time. Amen. Amen. He is. Thank you so much for being here at Taylor Chapel this morning. It's great to see your smiling faces out there and uh, just ready to give God all the glory and the thanks and the gratitude that he deserves. Um, if you're a visitor with us today, we especially uh, welcome you and extend the, the arms of love uh, from Jesus to you and hope that this service is something that talks to you, is meaningful for you, and something that brings you closer uh, to your maker and to your savior. Um, there are some, uh, some ways that you can find out more about our church. There are little connect cards in front of you under the chair or in the pew, and 
Uh, feel free to put your email address on there if you would like. And we send out a couple of communications each week, one for prayer needs and concerns and one for things that are going on in the life of the church. And um, it's a great way to get plugged in to what is happening here. And uh, there are just a, a few things that uh, you can uh, look at in your worship folder. Take that with you today. Uh, there's a calendar in there as well as uh, places to make notes uh, from, from Pastor Derek's sermon and uh, things to meditate on for, for the rest of the week. Replay some of the songs that we've sung today if they were meaningful to you, and uh, it's, all, it's all in here as well. Um, we're still looking for uh, school, Taylor Chapel preschool supply donations are always appreciated. Uh, that is in your, your worship folder, and uh, don't forget, if you're looking for, uh, if you're a lady and looking for something to plug into, that Marsha Fellowship um, is meeting on Thursday, June 17th at 2 p.m. So um, get plugged into what is going on here at Taylor. We thank you so much for coming. If you are able and wish to stand and we will sing a few praise songs to our Lord. <laughs>
Promise keeper? Is he your light in the darkness? He's our way maker when there is no way. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being all those things to us. We can't imagine what a burden it is or what a responsibility you have to be all those things. You have called yourself some of those things, and we call you those things, and your disciples have called you those things, and my goodness, that's, that's a lot to be. But you are. You are everything that we need you to be, and for that we give you, we give you all of our praise and all of our thanks and all of our love 
You are there when we need you in the middle of the night. You are there to share our joys with. And we just thank you so much. And most of all, you are our Savior. You are the way, the only way, the way maker. And for that, we say we love you. And all God's people said, amen. Let me hear your words above all other voices above all the distractions in this world. seated. Let's hear it for our praise team this morning. You know, for some of you who are new to us, uh, I just wanted to let you know all that sound was half the praise team, I think. You were, we had 
uh, I think four folks missing this morning, so that was half of what you normally get, and that, that half was pretty good, pretty good. We enjoyed that this morning. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. How about you? Is it good to be in the house of the Lord? We're here to praise God, and some Sundays are, some Sundays I need church more than others, you know? Always need church, but this Sunday's one of those. Uh, long week, we had our um, annual conference uh, with the United Methodist Church uh, this week, and normally, um, you know, it's, it's always, a, it, you know, it's like a, like any conference you'd go f- to with your work, there's a lot of uh, different seminars and gatherings and training and, and reporting and all those kind of things that go on, uh, but uh, uh, normally we would travel to Indianapolis or down to Marion and, uh, you know, we at least stay in a hotel and you get to hang around with some of your friends and have lunches and things, but this year was on Zoom. I don't know about you guys, I'm just tired of Zoom, you know. Uh, how exhausting. You know, usually I, I'd be gone for three days and, you know, it's kind of nice to think, well, at least I'll be sleeping in my own bed and, and that sort of thing, but, well, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, ten, eight, ten hour day on Zoom is exhausting. And how could it be so tiring sitting in, you know, a padded office chair, you know? It's hard to get anybody to feel sorry for you. But uh, unless you're one of those people that's had to sit on Zoom for eight hours, and, uh, uh, but there's just something exhausting about it. So anyway, I'm not promising anything about my sermon today because uh, uh, that was very time-consuming, and uh, uh, we had a lot going on. But uh, no, today, uh, I'm, I had a, uh, uh, a scripture that I read a, a few weeks ago, and it kind of spoke to me. And uh, uh, so our, our theme today, or our, our sermon title, is The Vessel of Honor. And as you can see, we have a lot of vessels out here. Uh, for you folks who don't know uh, old King James language, eh, vessel's a jar or a cup or a container, uh, anything that holds something. So anyway, that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today. So Without any further ado, if the kids had come up, we got a few kids here. Do you guys feel like coming up? All, all I need you to do is sit down here and uh, watch what I'm doing here today. It's not as interactive as it usually is. So just have a seat and don't be so enthused, you know. <laughs> Hi, Gracie. You want to sit down? You can sit here. Okay. Well, hey, this morning I wanted to read a Bible verse. And then I'm going to try to explain it a little bit. Did you notice that we've got all these pots up here and these cups and different bowls and stuff? Did you see this? These are all handmade, okay? They've all been made on a, on a wheel. Have you ever heard of a potter's wheel? Have you? You know, they call it throwing pots. You know, that's what all the in language is. That's the, the, you know, the cool language. They're pot throwing. And what you do is you just take a big lump of clay and you get it kind of wet and moist, and you put it on a wheel that goes around and around, and you use your hands like this to form it. And you, you can put lines in it, and it, and it just spins, 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 and you can make it go up taller like this one, or you can make it go down low like this one. And it's really art, artsy because, you know, you use your hands to do it. And uh, uh, anyway, I wanted to read this Bible verse that comes out of the book of Jeremiah. And in this Bible verse, um, the prophet's speaking for God. And he said, uh, God tells him to go down to the potter's house. Go down to the house where they're making these pots. And I'm going to give you a message when you get down there. So Jeremiah goes down there and says, So he went down to the potter's house, and he saw the potter working on that wheel, that wheel that was spinning the stuff. And he saw that the potter, if he was making something in it, went wrong or the clay got messed up he would just start over and I've seen them I've seen people do this they just smash what they're doing and they reform it and uh, so anyway he saw this and he said then the potter formed it into another pot shaping it as he seemed best so the potter he gets to decide he gets to be creative ex- exactly how he's going to make whatever he's making and then he goes on to say Lord came out to me and he said can I not do with you as this potter does like clay in my hand in the hand of the potter so are you in my hand and I thought 
Wow, what does that mean? Anybody have an idea what that means? They're comparing God to a potter, and what he makes is compared to us. We're his creation. And God is the one that creates, and he makes things the way that he wants to make them. Now, if you'll notice up here, these pots, these cups, these bowls, are any of them alike? No, they're all different. They're different sizes. Uh, they're different colors. They're different shapes. They're different shades. Some of them have three and four colors. Some of them have one. Some of them are big. Some of them are small. They're all different sizes. Every one of these is unique. Even these right here that is supposed to be like a matching set of coffee cups, do they all look the same? Look at that one. It's smaller than this one, isn't it? And this one's taller and not as wide. And these were even supposed to, on purpose, be made to be kind of the same. So why do you think I'm showing you this? You have any idea? No. Why I'm showing you this is because I want you to know that God makes you unique. Each one of these pots is unique, and God has made you unique. And they were all different, and we're all here for different reasons. You know, some of these are for holding liquid. These are maybe for cornflakes in the morning for breakfast. This is for Pastor Derek's coffee on the morning. You know, and each one of these has a different purpose and a different meaning. Are any of these better than the other? No. They just have a different purpose. None of them are the same. They're all a little bit different, but the one thing they have in, in common and one thing that makes them the same, God made them all. One potter made all these. God, you being the pots, has made all of you the same, but you're all unique and different for your own purpose. Does that make any sense? Does that make any sense to you? Well, I'm glad I made sense to you. I don't, sometimes I don't make sense to myself. So anyway, well, let's pray. And then we'll have children's church, okay? Bow with me. Dear God, we just thank you that, uh, that you love us and you forgive us and you care for us. Lord, we thank you that you've made us all different, but that we're all made by the same potter, so we have that in common. Lord, thank you that you've made us for different purposes. Let us work hard to find out those purposes and to live in them. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's hear it for our kids. If you guys want to go, ch children's church is that way. Okay? And it may be more fun than listening to Pastor Derek. This morning, the scripture <clears throat> that I wanted to uh, share with you is uh, it's from 2 Timothy. And we know that Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the writer of the book of Timothy and the second, second book of Timothy. And these books were, uh, Paul is kind of like uh, Timothy's mentor. You know, Timothy's like Paul's understudy. And these are great books, full of practical wisdom and advice to us. And uh, anyway, Paul is uh, uh, instructing Timothy, and he's instructing us as he instructs Timothy. And uh, I, I just loved this verse, and it just, it just caught me. So uh, I'm going to read from uh, 2 Timothy. I'm going to read uh, verse 20 through 21, and then I'm going to kind of stop, and then we'll pick up uh, as we go. So follow along with me, if you will, on the screen or in your Bible um, from word, Paul's words in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel of honor, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You know, when I read this, I was kind of uh, thinking that uh, Paul is telling us that, you know, all the vessels are different, 
and uh, that some of them are used for honorable purposes and some dishonorable. And as I uh, looked up this scripture in commentary, and uh, if you, any of you ever study Bibles, there's Bible commentaries, and, and the experts uh, in theology tell us what the scripture means. So anyway, I always like to see what they say, and, and, and let me just say that some commentary is a little more common than others, all right? And uh, anyway, when I read this, uh, over and over and over, the commentaries said that uh, um, some of the vessels, some of the glasses, some of the containers are made of gold and some are silver. And these are the honorable ones. And then the wood and the clay are the ones that are dishonorable. And that we should strive or want to be the gold and silver rather than the wood and clay. Because the gold and silver, they hold the honorable spot. He will be a vessel of honor and set apart because, you know, we keep the gold and the silver in a different place than we do the wood and the clay, right? Because they're of value. And these will be set apart as holy and they will be useful to the master of the house ready for every good work. Well, you know, when I read that, I just thought, that doesn't, that doesn't seem right. I don't think that's what Paul was saying. Can't a wooden cup hold the finest wine and a gold goblet hold vinegar? And is Paul trying to tell us that it's the outside, the appearance of the gold or silver? You know, uh, everything I read in Scripture or the way I understand Scripture is that God looks at the inside, not the outside. So this didn't seem to make sense to me. It seems to me that it wouldn't matter what's on the outside or what kind of container something's in. The value of it is what's in it, right? Isn't that where the value is? And I think that's what, I think that's what this scripture says. The only prerequisite is to cleanse himself from what is dishonorable. So what does that look like? What's it look like to cleanse ourselves from dishonor? Well, I, I, I'd have to say I, I'm going to refer to 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9. And there's so many other verses that say something similar to this. It, it says, how, how do we, how do we come, become cleansed and, and go from dishonorable to honorable? Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And therefore, immediately, we go from that place of dishonorable to honorable. And it's not of our own accord. It's not of our own works. It's not of what we've done. It's what God has done for us. So what does that look like? What does it look like to do that? What are some of the things that, that we would do? Well, Timothy goes on uh, to be instructed by Paul in this way. And we go into verse 22. He says, so if you want to cleanse yourself and you want to go from dishonorable to honorable, here's some of the things you should do. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Well, you know, that makes a lot of sense. You know, when you're young, you might have some, some passions that, uh, uh, that you might want to, want to get yourself from, away from, separate yourself from. You know, I know, you know when I was young, I, did, I, I lived my, my feelings, my emotions, and, uh, um, you know, so think about what you're passionate about. What are the passions in your life? And, and, and pursue righteousness in your passions rather than unrighteousness. Then it's, he goes on to say that faith, love, and peace, these are the good things. Seek those out in your passions. If your passion is about your faith, if it's about love, if it's about peace, then, then your passions are okay. Along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Also, engage with other people who long for these same kind of passions. You know, who's your group? Is it, is it a group of people who have faith, who have love, who live in peace? 
Or, or, or are you with faithless people that are angry and hate and uh, uh, always looking for a fight? Then it goes on to say, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Is that a word to us today? You know, do you really want to die on this hill? Haven't you heard that said? I mean, you, you got to choose your fights. I mean, are, are you going to be one of those people that lashes out on anybody that, that disagrees with you? Uh, and some things, uh, you might have an opinion on it, but we'll just keep your opinion to yourself. We have to choose our battles and, and think about how we talk to other people and how we treat people. If you attack people, insult people, put people down, no one is going to hear what you have to say. It's like crying wolf. If I disagree all the time, then I'm just, I, I'm just considered a disagreeable person. And no one will hear you. It says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponent with gentleness. Now, it doesn't say that you have to listen to somebody and agree with what they are ob obviously wrong about. But do you have to fight with them? If you disagree every time, they're never going to listen to you when you do make a good point. And I see this so much. I see this so much. <laughs> you know, uh, you get branded or, or, or you get looked at as one of those kind of people, whatever that means. And then people don't listen to what you have to say anymore anyway. They already know what you think. Right? They already know what you think. Now, uh, now you can't teach now you can't correct. This scripture does not tell you that, that you have to just listen to what everybody says and go along with it or agree with them, not to be quarrelsome. It says not to be quarrelsome. Don't fight with everybody over everything. I instead, you can always state your point, but do it with gentleness and with patience and enduring. And not being quarrelsome. It's like what, you catch more flies with sugar. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. You know, if you talk kindly, if you don't fight with every single person you disagree with, people might listen to you. And something might happen where God comes into their heart and, and all of a sudden they feel that they, they, they understand the truth. They feel the need to go to him and ask repentance and give their life. Leading to the knowledge of the truth. And he goes on to say, and they, because of this, may come to their senses. And what would happen if they come to their senses they will escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Isn't that the kind of people we want to be? The ones that help people from the snare of the devil. The ones that point out the hole and push the person out of the way before they fall in it. Aren't, aren't, aren't we wanting to be the salt and the light and the ones who are difference makers in people's lives. We can't do that with quarreling and with fighting. So what about these vessels? What about the vessel of honor? You know, uh, when, when, when you have to preach sermons all the time, you're always trying to connect dots, and, and you go from one story to the next to the next, and sometimes they don't seem to con connect, and sometimes they just kind of connect. And, and what inspired me with this whole idea was uh, 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 several weeks ago, just a few weeks ago, I guess, um, I got a message. Uh, and it was, uh, 
it was a little after 11 at night. I was already in bed, and uh, the little alarm ding thing goes off on my phone. And uh, since I have uh, boys in their 20s, I still answer all those. <laughs> well, I at least look at them. And, you know, because you know, just have to be safe. And I looked at it, and it was a message from a, a guy who I uh, hadn't seen in a long, long time. He used to be a friend of mine. I guess he's still a friend of mine because we never stopped being friends, but hadn't talked to him in ages. And th this person happens to be very, very smart. He's a very smart guy. He, uh, you know, he graduated with an MBA, and he went on to uh, work in, in uh, trading and, and uh, a brokerage firm and had a very successful uh, career with that. And then, then later on, he did something that was so amazing to me. He went back to school, and he went into nursing. It's like, how does a person go from you know, Wall Street, corporate kind, a person into nursing. It's because he has a good heart. And how can you learn two things like that? I mean, if you've ever taken economics or human anatomy, you know, I mean, these are difficult fields. And, and, and he didn't just become like any old nurse. He worked at, at trauma emergency room nursing. I mean, he was in, you know, the hotbed uh, on, on the line. And uh, anyway, he hadn't talked to him in a while. He lives out of state. And uh, I opened up the message, and, and I'm just going to read what he said. Okay, he says, I have a question for you, if I'm not being too presumptuous. Do you see any conflict in claiming to be Christian after a conversion a revelatory, uh, revelatory experience seven years ago and practicing Buddhism meditation with the pursuit of achieving higher level of enlightenment, which I believe may be the infusion of light, the light of the world, the one true light. I would put it like this, a Buddhist meditation practicing Christian. A Buddhist meditation practicing Christian. Kind of like a Torah observing friend, my Masonic, a Masonic Jew. So this is this is you know this is how this guy talks for one. Yeah, this is how this guy talks for one. And uh, anyway, I'm thinking you know this this is this is it's eleven o'clock. Angel's looking over me. What are you doing? Uh, you know, it's like, what am I doing? And then I started thinking about it, and I tried to go back to sleep, and I couldn't. Then I thought, you know, I can't just send him anything that I'm typing on my phone from the bed because, uh, you know, I need spell check and my grammar because he's definitely going to, you know, point that out. He's an educated guy. I can't look like a fool. And, you know, so I started thinking about it, and, you know, it just popped in my head the reason why this was important to me. Okay, now, I, I'm going to say something that, that uh, you, you all might not agree with, but I've been watching TV lately, and I've noticed that commercials have really changed. They don't, they don't look like they did when I was a kid. I'm getting old. I don't mean to sound like my dad, but, you know, something's changed about them. And one of the things that I, I notice is, you know, the idea of commercials hasn't changed. The idea is branding, uh, you know, to get people to buy a product. You want to uh, put out the, the idea that of the perfect person or the, the successful person or the cool person, what, what it looks like to be, you know, that person that everybody wants to be. And the thing that I've noticed is that all you women are now doing yoga. Are you all doing yoga? Because I'm telling you what, Every cool woman on TV is doing yoga. You know, I, I see the TV commercials for you know, prescription drugs, and it doesn't matter how old you are, you're still doing yoga. The young ones are doing yoga, but especially the cool ones, you know? And I'm thinking, you know, why is yoga the thing that makes you cool? Well, this guy here, you know, here, here's a smart guy, a responsible guy, a Christian guy, and uh, he's talking about meditation, Buddhist meditation, which is, is yoga. And I think the form of yoga that uh, most people 
uh, or, you know, that are in the commercials, or most of you, if any of you are, do yoga. And I'm not knocking it, but if, if you do, it, it's probably more about your physical, being able to stretch and, and being flexible. And, you know, it's not like that I shouldn't be looking out for my health and some kind of health program. So I'm not knocking that. But what gets me about it is the question about the spiritual connection. And I think that's what makes it cool. I think the idea here is that I'm killing two birds with one stone. You know, I'm working out. I'm not dancing with the oldies or, uh, you know, I'm not doing uh, some kind of uh, uh, other, you know, cool, uh, you know, workout program, but I'm taking a workout program, and at the same time, I'm adding a spiritual element, a cool element, because who doesn't want to be cool and spiritual? Why is this important to so many people? I think a lot of people are missing that in their lives, and that's why this has become such a hot thing. It's such a, a, such a, a point of interest. And as I read my friend's message, I started thinking, why is this guy, and I know his conversion story, it's amazing. I mean, this guy had no connection to faith. He, he was actually uh, an atheist when I went to school with him. I remember him debating uh, our teachers. You know, and he came from a family that, that didn't follow any kind of faith practice, and he had this great experience and, and changed his life, and he, he became a Christian and here he is now asking me what I think, because, you know, I'm an expert, what I think about this and what he should do. And it really got me. So here's my great answer at 12 o'clock in the morning. I wrote back to him and I said, I'm not all that familiar with all the precepts of Buddhism. I am a bit more familiar with Christian meditation. The best that I understand, Eastern meditation seeks to empty the body and mind, whereas the goal of Christian meditation is to feel, to feel the body and the mind, to fill it up. And after he talked to me about all this light, enlightenment, and light stuff, I, I had to reply to that too. And I said, and, and Jesus claims over and over that he is the light and that no one comes to the Father, the one and only true light, except through him. So as long as you claim Christ as the one way to eternal things, then and only then are you living in the true light? So I sent this to him. And he replied right back, thank you. You read it. And the next day, we talked on the phone for three hours. We talked on the phone for three hours. And it was good for me. It wasn't me. <laughs> wasn't me telling him how it was. It was him and I having a conversation about our faith and, and what's going on in his life and what's going on in my life. And, and my concern is, why, why is he seeking this? You know, it seems to me that people are seeking something. It's because they're, they're not full. Something's lacking. And as I talked to him, that's what I found out. You know, he talked to me about his, his uh, revelation experience that he had and it, it was an amazing story you know it, it was it was a story where God spoke to him and he actually audibly heard God okay this isn't a crazy guy and I shared my story with him I remember mine you know I remember what happened to me I was in a closet a janitor's closet reading the Psalm 37 when I felt God speaking to me and I read the words that God was telling me I didn't get the cool experience he did where I got the audible thing what a rip off he gets all the good stuff but I asked him I said have you ever heard God's voice since then and he said no and we came to the conclusion that he felt like he was lacking because 
that experience was so beautiful and so powerful and so great, he wanted more. Is there anything wrong with that? Not a bit. He wanted more. And when people want more, they'll, they'll look for it in, in unusual places. They'll look for it. If we're full, then we feel filled. And we don't need to seek out. Because our seeking, in our seeking, we may go down the wrong road or, or, or pick the wrong thing. You know, when I, I, these pots, these, our son Jimmy made these. And I'm pretty proud about that. Jimmy, uh, if you knew him, he's a wrestler. He's a wrestler. And he's, he's, a, he's a rough neck kid. And, and he's, uh, you know, always been, he's always been a, 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 a real uh, um, athlete. And, and uh, uh, he wears these Wrangler jeans. And, and you know, he's, he's that kind of kid, drives a truck. And uh, we were shocked when one day he came home from school and he had this. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's, that's kind of nice. There's a hole in it. I don't know that I'd have put, picked dark gray. And then the next thing I know, Jimmy's coming home with stuff like this. Jimmy had this beautiful talent that God had given him to throw pots. Who would have thought it, you know? And, and I want you to look at some of the, you know, this. Look at the color. Look at the color of this, this color scheme. Who would have thought it? Blue with green with yellow. And this kid can't even match his, his Wranglers to his flannel shirt. But he can do this. He can do this. And it's, you know, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And Angel and I just loved it. Uh, because, you know, it was so different. And, you know, you want your kids to be balanced and stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, one day he was in my office. And he said, uh, you know, he said, you just have all those pots there. They're like trophies, Dad. He said, and I've already put away my trophies. He said, uh, he said, now look at this one. He said, uh, you keep your pins in it. And you use it. He said, so that pot is the most useful and it's probably the ugliest I've ever done. Yet it's the most useful. So therefore, it's fulfilling its purpose. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And I started thinking about that, and it's like, it's so true. It is so true. And it's true about us. You know, all these, all these vessels are different. And, and what more are they if they're not being used? And there is a, a good purpose for each of them. And I don't know if you've noticed, but some of these you've seen around. This, this one was up on our altar. We still have the notes we put at Lent in it. And we've used this one. And, you know, I, I put oil in this one to, to, to pour in this one. Jimmy, how smart. You know, he took a pot and then he just smashed it with his hand and he made it a pitcher. I would have never thought of that. He's so much smarter than me. You know, and, and I started thinking about it, and he's so right. These are of no value. They're not of any good as trophies. That isn't what they were made for. They're vessels made for a purpose. And when they are doing their purpose, when their pur purpose, it, 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 when they're being used for something, then the potter's happy. Jimmy didn't make these to put on a shelf. He made these to pour water, to hold pens, to hold Pastor Derek's coffee. He made these to, with a purpose in mind. And he was so wanting me to know that that's why they're here. And that's why I'm trying to make use of them. That is, that is what I see as the core of a problem for a lot of people is we don't Live into our purpose. You know, uh, our, our, our coffee cup's not filled up. You know, and, and when, when it's not filled all the way, you're going to put something, you know, like heavy cream in there that you shouldn't have in there. 
You're going to put something in there that you shouldn't have. Or you're always going to be thinking about what you need to fill you up. Now, we're just a vessel. And God gives us our value. You know, just think about it. If, you know, if, some, if you were to say, hey, Pastor Derek, I'd love some hot coffee. How about I just take a pitcher and throw it in your face? Would you like that? No, you want a cup of hot coffee because the hot coffee is of no value until it's in a cup, right? Can you imagine you order a, a pizza and the doorbell rings, you come downstairs, hey man, I got your pizza. And there's mozzarella and mushrooms and pepperonis rolling down some guy's arm and it's all bent over and you don't know where that hand's been and then you think how'd he get it here and what's in his car you know what, what's the first thing you're going to say where's the box man are you crazy I'm not eating that thing where's the box man this is a 39 cent box and if you go over to B. Antonio's pizza and ask for one of these you probably have to buy a pizza first for them to give you a free box but if you go over and ask them for one of these they're going to tell you it's only worth 39 cents and they all look the same and you know this thing has even less value than that to me what am I going to do with it it's worth 39 cents. But friends, what I want you to know is, and I want you to understand, in, in the nicest of ways, what I'm telling you is, you are the box. You're the box. And your value is not this. Your value is what's in it. I can tell you yesterday, we had one of these boxes, and this is worth 39 cents, but when, when it was filled with a 16-inch double deluxe with extra cheese, it was worth 36.40. <laughs> right? The value, the value is not the box. The value is what you put in the box. That, that's when the box becomes valuable. And without that pizza in it, it's just a piece of cardboard that I've got to figure out where to put it to throw it away. Right? Our value comes from what's in us. We're just the vessel. But in order to be the vessel, we have to be what? We have to be open. We have to be empty, emptied out. We have to be clean. You know, uh, that pizza box I used yesterday. It was awful greasy on the bottom. They, they, they wouldn't want to reuse that, right? You know, it has to be clean. What, what person, uh, you know, wants to drink out of a, a coffee mug that has mold in it? You know, it has to be clean. It has to be open. You have to be open to it. You, can, you throw the pizza on top here, it's going to fall off. It's still not a value. And you have, you have, it has to be empty. If it's got a bunch of stuff in it, the pizza won't fit in there. You're a pizza box. A vessel. A vessel to be used. In closing, I want to read just this little story uh, from the Old Testament. It's a, it's a, it comes from 2 Kings chapter 4. And uh, you may or may not have heard of it. Uh, it's, it's, you know one of those little obscure stories, but I thought it fit so well with what was going on here. I'll read it to you. Um, the wife of a man from the, the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. This is the prophet Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha. Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered, revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two sons as his slaves. And Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Well, here's what's going on. Uh, here, here's this widowed woman. Her 
husband has passed away and he was a servant and a good man but uh, you know she she has not been employed and she's lacking funds and back in those days if you didn't pay your bill you didn't get a knock on your credit history uh, you didn't get an annoying phone call they come and knock your door down take your children and that's what's happening here the creditors are beating on the door and you either pay up or we're taking your kids. Does this sound like, like a mafia mob movie kind of thing? You know, this is how it was done back then. So she is all upset. She's got to come up with some way to get these people off her door and, and to pay them off. And, and so she's asking the, the prophet Elisha to help her and to, to, to keep her sons from becoming slaves to pay off a debt. That's, that's what we're, we're, we got going here. So... Um, how can I help you, he says. Duh, come up with something. This is important. Tell me, and this is what he asks her, tell me what do you have in the house? Well, that's a good question, right? Well, you know, do you have any uh, stocks or bonds or, you know, Bitcoin? Or do you, do you have something stashed away of value? What do you have? And she answers back, your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Small jar of olive oil. I'm thinking this right here. Small jar of olive oil. Back in those days, olive oil was currency. It was tradable. You could use it. But how much can you get? Can you keep two of your sons from being enslaved by, by a little jar of olive oil? I don't think that's going to carry it, but it's some place to start, right? That's what she has. That's it. So Elisha says, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty vessels, empty jars, bowls, you know, jugs. Don't ask for just a few, but many. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. So what is she doing? He says, get as many jars as you can. And she's thinking, what for? I got just one little jug. I just got one jug of olive oil. Why would I be getting this? But she just does what she's told. So they get as many as they can. And it's important, he says, then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. You know, shut the world out. Go in privacy and do this. You know, uh, go to your prayer closet. Uh, uh, separate yourself from the world and be in the presence of God and, and expect something to happen. So they do this. Pour olive oil into the jars and as each is filled, set it aside. She left him, so she does what she, he says. She left him and she shut the door behind her and her sons and they brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. She kept pouring. So as they bring jars this size to her, she's pouring and she's pouring and she's pouring and she keeps pouring out of this little jug. And she keeps pouring. And, and what, what, what's the, the scripture say? When all the jars were, were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. <laughs> bring me another one. But the son replied, there's not a jar left. He goes on to say, then the oil stopped flowing. When did the oil stop flowing? When there were no more vessels. And as long as there were vessels, there was oil. So, so what does this story tell us? The problem is not in the oil. The problem's in the vessels. Because that little jug, it would have produced as much oil as there were vessels to put it in. Right? God has an overabundance of what he can pour out onto you. It's just that he, he needs more vessels. We talk about being the hands and feet of Jesus. 
You know, the Holy Spirit can't get up here and give a sermon. The Holy Spirit can't go and, and give my, uh, food to a food bank. The Holy Spirit can't lead a Bible school class. The Holy Spirit doesn't take care of kids in the nursery. The vessel does. And the vessel that's filled with the right thing, the vessel that is filled with the Spirit, will do the things that God wants them to do. And they will be filled. They will be full. You determine. You determine how much you receive. God's supply is limitless. Shut the door. Get your vessel ready and, and have it filled. The oil stopped because they ran out of vessels. And what about you? Are you a vessel? Are you a, 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 a box? What are you filled with? Or are you completely filled? And if you're not full, something else is going to fill that space. It will be filled. But with what? And what do you want it filled with? My yoga friend, he was full. And over time, he started to dwindle out a little bit and things came into his life and he used up some of his oil and, and, and he didn't replenish it and he was looking for something to fill that space how many people have the glass half full and, and they're needing to fill it friends if you fill it with the wrong thing it, it, it'll make it sour it'll make it bad but with God it doesn't matter how much space you have, he can fill it. And he will fill it. All you need to do is shut the door and bring him your vessel. If you've got a hymnal in front of you, open it up to page 641. And even if you don't, you probably know this song. I want to say a prayer and then I'd like for us to close with just singing this chorus okay let's bow to the Lord dear Heavenly Father I thank you that uh, you are the source and Lord I thank you that uh, you have made me your vessel and Father I ask that uh, that you would fill me again keep me full and Lord help me to continue to do the work for your kingdom Lord help me uh, to help others and Lord, uh, I just pray that, uh, that you will always give me the desire to seek you out and to follow you in a fuller way. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul bread of heaven feed me till I want no more fill my cup fill it up and make me whole amen <laughs>